AWS Loft Talks. What I'd like to talk a little bit about is how at Netflix we're thinking about deploying things securely within Amazon, as opposed to sort of Amazon specific features. We'll talk a little bit about that. We'll talk a little bit about um, how we're building stuff on top of that as well and what that looks like, uh, both to give you a feel for how we do things at Netflix and also um, what we view as best practices in this space for others that are interested in, in following along. The team at Netflix that's responsible for this is called the Platform Security Team. And I think the best way to describe what this team is really about is to give it in the context of our entire ecosystem. And, um, and there's actually uh, several security teams at Netflix that work together to achieve security for everything that we do. Um, and so to understand that, uh, I'd like to give this really high level view of what our service actually looks like. So the way uh, it works at a very high level is, is you would connect to our service from some sort of device or browser, right? And um, from there, you would, you would browse the catalog by talking to um, what we would call the control plane or everything that we put in AWS. Um, and in order to facilitate that, there's a ton of microservices that are running on the back end. Um, a ton both because of the large load that we're, that we're handling, but also because there's a lot of work that's going on. A lot of personalization, a lot of you know, going through the catalog to figure out what it is that you want to watch, um, knowing what you watched last week might influence what you're going to watch this week, all this kind of stuff. Once you eventually decide to watch something, um, then that uh, handoff happens where you actually end up connecting to a Netflix Open Connect appliance. This is actually our own content delivery network, and that is what delivers the bytes to your device um, so that you can actually watch the show, right, or watch the movie. Now, the reason that we do that is because, of course, uh, it would be a little inefficient to stream all of those bytes from AWS to every single device across the internet. And so these open connect appliances, like, like a traditional CDN, are positioned closer to where the end users are, right? So we can get those, that data to them more easily. Um, so when you think of the system like that, there's obviously a lot of need around content protection and device security uh, in this world. And we have a team that focuses on those issues. Um, there's also a lot of need on the right side. It's probably a little small for some in the back to see. Uh, but lots of things that are necessary for security, like um, monitoring the code that we develop. Is it written securely? Right? Taking care of all the AWS accounts and making sure that they're managed properly. Um, forensics, incidents response. All these sort of traditional security roles, even basic IT security, um, are, are all hundred, ha handled by separate security teams. And then we have platform security. So what do we actually do? Uh, we're actually working on what can we build inside the cloud to help secure all the microservices that we're deploying in the cloud. And also, how can we turn around and help all the services actually use these, these things that we build so that they themselves can be more secure? Um, so that's kind of abstract. So the rest of my talk, I'm going to get into a little more details to give you a better sense of, of what that is like. But first, um, I'm going to kind of go all the way back to the early days of security and ask who here has studied the history of security enough to know like Orange Book and 1970s, 1980s air security? A couple, okay. So for those that were sort of nodding inconveniently, um, if I asked you what a security kernel was, anyone have a, no one wants to fuss up to that. Okay, so back in the day when people were building, now these are sort of one-off systems that were designed to be ultra secure, um, the way to do it was to use this technique called a security kernel. And they have most of this diagram, they don't have the bottom, and I'll get into that in a moment. But the idea is that the security kernel is part software and part hardware, and they work in concert to be the trusted piece of your system. And the rest of the system should be designed such that if you actually trust the security kernel, then the rest of your system should be secure, under some definition of secure. So all of your security decisions are made down in the security kernel. Everything else on top, in theory, doesn't need to be as trusted. Um, and this is how people were building systems back in the day, back when they were doing Orange Book evaluations and people were saying, oh, the system is classified as an A1 security system and all these kinds of things, if that means anything. What's notable, in my mind at least, is that even in this world, where you had one system and you were trying to secure it and you were being very rigorous with how you built your software, there's a lot of unknowns underneath, right? Um, there's things like supply chain attacks. Um, there's things like, do you really trust the people that made your hardware such that the hardware part of the security kernel is operating exactly like you would think it would to spec? Um, 
Do you trust your firmware? Do you trust that there aren't any malicious insiders that are using the system inappropriately, right? There's always these things on the periphery that, that you just have to implicitly trust, regardless of how well you engineer your systems. And I would argue that today, we have some of the same challenges um, in the cloud. But it's not necessarily a terrible thing. It's the same challenges we've always had. And so I hear a lot of people say, hey, when I move to the cloud, all of a sudden I have to trust all this stuff that's going on underneath, underneath me that, that maybe before I didn't have to trust. And I would push back and say, yes, this great unknown still exists. And in some cases, it's greater. There's more pieces. Um, but you're also deploying potentially much larger things on top of it. And so there might be larger pieces that you have to implicitly trust. So what it comes down to is this may be appropriate for certain things, like a Netflix, um, like other services. This may be inappropriate for other things, like nuclear command and control, right? So you have to decide at what level of security you're comfortable deploying in the cloud. And there's probably a boundary somewhere between those two ranges that I just gave. However, once you get past the great unknown, there's some really interesting services that uh, AWS provides. And so one of the things that we're trying to do on the platform security team is to say, what are the handful of services that we can build off of that will allow us to then have a foothold that we can use to, to provide security for the rest of our ecosystem. And today, what that looks like is we use the Cloud HSM, um, which is a hardware security module deployed, connected to an instance in the cloud. And I'll you do all the HSM things, if you're familiar with that. Um, there's a service called the Instance Metadata Service, um, and it actually has um, a route on it that provides a signature on the data. And we do some interesting things with that that I'm not gonna get into great depths on today, but um, we may be talking in the future about it more as that sort of matures. Um, and then there's, um, of course, IAM roles and all that stuff, which, which others have spoken about a bit tonight. Um, but the idea is, with these foundational things that Amazon provides, then you can start to build services up from there, right? So we go from the layer that, sort of the, the shared responsibility model that others have talked about. Here's the layer that we get, this is the layer that we build. And so what do we have? Well, Cloud HSM, who in the room has worked with HSMs? Okay, I see a couple of very poor souls kind of, oh, I'm sorry, I played with them. Um, okay, for those of you that didn't raise your hand, uh, let me just say that, that they're sort of a very useful construct, but they're also a harken back into the day before clouds when everything was REST API and nice and friendly and convenient. And, uh, and HSMs can be painful to work with sometimes, um, or most of the time. And so one of the things that we did to make that a little better is uh, we have an internal service that sits in front of the HSMs and provides a lot of useful things like HA across multiple HSMs, um, provides inter region replication of the keys because you don't wanna lose your keys, um, provides things like a very nice REST API to allow you to actually, um, to actually connect to the service so that other people can talk to you in a meaningful way and don't really have to deal with all the stuff that is HSMs. Um, so, so that's very handy. And then um, the secret deployment service um, imagine you spin up an instance and you want to have a TLS private key on your instance. How does that get there? We talked a little bit about DevSecOps earlier and one of the tenants was, hey, you shouldn't have to, uh, to, to you know, input something when you bring up your instance, right? So where does that private data come from? Do you stick it in your Git repo? Except we talk about not wanting to do that earlier, right? So how do you handle this problem? There's a bootstrapping problem. and um, we're looking at ways now that we can do this. We have some techniques for doing it now. We're looking at ways to improve it. Um, but bottom line is there's some clever things that you can do um, so that basically you can put encrypted secrets in Git and then when your instance deploys, they get unsealed and then you can use them and, um, and then you can protect it against some of those problems that we talked about earlier. Of course, everyone needs a CA. I say everyone. This is assuming that you're actually using things like, like OpenSSL and other PKI infrastructures. Um, there are alternative ways to approach these problems, but it's a pretty traditional way to go. And if you go that way, you probably want a CA. So we have a nice self-service CA um, that of course builds on top of the HSMs and all that. So you can actually um, set up a, your own PKI ecosystem for your application in our cloud. And you can say, hey, give me, give me a root cert, give me some client certs, build that out, and then deploy my application in its own little ecosystem, which is quite nice. So other pieces that we work on, um, include the platform itself. So who here is familiar with the, uh, some of the Netflix open source software pieces? Oh, quite a few more hands, excellent. So a lot of those pieces that you see when you go to our website, it, 
are pieces that we've put out there that basically help you to build and deploy microservices more easily, right? And the pieces that I've labeled here on the slide in white are open source components uh, that, that we've put out there. Now, we're called the platform security team at Netflix. It turns out there's a platform engineering team that is the team that puts out a lot of these open source components. And the similarity in names is, is not a coincidence. We sit right next to them, we work closely with them. And the thing is, within Netflix, we use a lot of these pieces as well. And whenever we're deploying these services, we would want the default framework, the default code base that everyone's using to present a system that's as secure as possible for everyone, right? And in, in that way, as people go down this road of, I'm just gonna worry about my application logic and I'm gonna use all these underlying libraries and frameworks to make everything very nice, um, hopefully what they get is a system that's very secure out of the box and they don't even have to worry about security. Um, so a lot of thought about how can we make this transparent? How can we make it secure by default? These kinds of things. Um, just to walk through some of the pieces here, um, Hystrix is like a circuit breaker pattern. Um, so what could possibly go wrong there? Well, uh, it's interesting, you know, the idea here is you could have a, a call that fails, some, 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 something that happens that fails, and you fall back to another implementation. Um, what would be the security implication of that, right? It's, these things are not very easy to discern using tools and automation. These are the kinds of things where you need to go partner with someone and sit down and, and look at their code and figure out what's the implication of how they wrote it. Um, things like uh, Ribbon is actually, um, gives you uh, fault tolerance on the client side for a REST, REST client, and Eureka is a discovery um, server, so it can help you find all the instances that you deployed for a given service. Um, so you put all that together, you probably want your discovery service to be as secure as possible, so that when you're saying, hey, tell me who to talk to, it's actually coming back and telling you the right people to talk to. Um, so there's a lot of interesting security implications with these underlying frameworks, and it's important to get those right out of the box. And so one of the things that we're gonna be doing going forward is partnering with these folks to improve those pieces. So even if you don't see, um, you may see some open source work directly from our team, but hopefully you'll also see us contributing to these uh, core foundational pieces as well. Another area that I think is very important because it's used broadly across the Netflix e ecosystem is what we call the bakery. Um, and the idea here is that when people are deploying an application, the way we do it is we have a base installation of the operating system, something that's pretty lightweight, we deploy some common dependencies on it. We deploy the actual application logic that you've created. And that gets baked into an Amazon machine image, which then gets deployed into Amazon, and then you can launch it and run it. Um, that's all fine and dandy, but if you think about the programmer up there, they're really focused on the application logic of what it is that they're creating, right? So they're kind of not really looking at the operating system itself. If you ask these programmers, hey, what what uh, services are running on that instance that you just stood up? Which ports are open? Um, how is SSH locked down? That's really not something that they're thinking about because frankly, they shouldn't be thinking about it, right? They should be thinking about their application logic. But someone needs to be thinking about it. Someone needs to be putting all these pieces together and make sure that when you go through this process and you bake an image, that the image comes out of the box with good security faults. And so that's one of the things that we're gonna be working on as well. Just kind of a parting thought on, um, on how we think about security, philosophy of security. And this is uh, actually quite challenging. So if you look at the Netflix ecosystem and, and how we operate, um, you can go online and find, search for Netflix Culture Deck, for example. And you see that the way that the Netflix as a company operates is, is somewhat unique um, in that it's a culture of freedom and responsibility. So it allows any engineer to do whatever they think makes sense, to work at whatever speed they see fit, and get a lot of things done very rapidly. Um, it also means that things that would be sort of anti-culture for us might be exactly how other places operate, right? A security person coming in and saying, everyone has to use these minimum security standards. That's just required, and everyone stops working until that's done. That's never gonna happen, right? Um, and so instead, what you have to think about is how do you partner with these other teams? How do you find ways to encourage people to want to do security well, or at least to do it under the hood and they don't even know what's happening, um, and to, to work to improve things sort of in, in that way? Um, so that is sort of our model. And I mentioned that there's other teams that do code review. So imagine up top here, some, some team is creating their service. Um, we partner with the teams that review that service and, and they find problems with it, right? Maybe there was actually a security incident, hopefully not, but maybe that happens. Maybe there was some iron forensics that happened. All this data comes back and the idea is that we create this feedback loop, right? Where we sort of identify problems, we figure out 
what's the, what's the risk factor? Is this, is this some service that we don't care about? Can we fix it easily? Is this some really critical piece of data that we really can't lose as a company? And we're gonna, we're gonna hit it hard. We find the improvements. Are the improvements to the base platform, like I was talking about? Are the improvements needing new security services? Are the improvements in the bakery? Are they something else? And we figure out how to deploy them. And it might be that we improve our services or implement new services. It might be that we partner with teams to actually improve the creation of their stuff themselves. And then this red line, if you can see it, intentionally sort of cuts this implement line off halfway. The idea is that hopefully we can augment internal teams by providing software engineering expertise that are also security expertise to help them out. But it, there's also sort of an education that happens as you work with the other teams, and hopefully over time they get more competent in security themselves as well. AWS Loft Talks.